Today on CCHF Talk. You're opening yourself up to suffer. If you're going to love people who need to be loved, it's going to be hard sometimes. CCHF Talk is produced by Christian Community Health Fellowship, where healthcare providers, executives, and students come together to educate, encourage, and engage. Join us as we explore topics related to healthcare to marginalized communities. Those talks, those conversations. CCHF Talk. I'm Susan Post. I'm from Esperanza Health Center, and my partner back there is Rick Donlin, Dr. Rick Donlin from Memphis, Tennessee. We're really glad that we're here together today. The title of our talk is something about the long defeat. Does it have to be so defeating? And I see that there's some Esperanza people here, and I would like them to, you know, be dismissed right now because I don't want you to hear my failures. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll go with God's grace in that. So I was at a conference that Rick was speaking in in the fall, and I forget what the topic of his uh, conference was, but he somebody asked him the question. I think it was a, a missionary, a person who wanted to become a missionary in a, another country, and he said, you know, there's a lack of doctors or whatever. There's not that many resources. So sometimes, maybe, would it be better if you don't go to the places where they don't have many resources, the poor places? And would it be better if maybe you went somewhere where you could be more successful? <laughs> and I remember Rick said right away, uh, no, I don't think I'd do it that way, because this is where Jesus would go. And he wouldn't say that Jesus wouldn't go to other places, but he's like, this is part of it. This is part of our calling. This is part of what uh, God's called us to do and be. And when he said that, it reminded me of this quote I had from Paul Farmer. I don't know if anybody knows who he is, who he was. He's passed away, but he was a doctor who his whole life's call was to take care of people in creative ways where there were no resources. So he, I think he worked to get help for tuberculosis for people that were in jail and HIV for people who were in jail. He, he started a lot of things in Haiti. He went to places that were um, almost impossible, and he just kept moving forward to try to find resolutions. They asked Paul Farmer one day, what are you doing? Like, how, how come you're always with the losers? I, don't, I wouldn't call any of our patients losers, but that's what they said to him. And he said, of course we want to be on the winning team, don't we? We're all like medical people. We want to be on the winning team. We want to get good grades. We want to be successful. But at the risk of turning our backs on the losers, no, it's not worth it. And so we fight the long fight the long defeat. So just to sort of try to describe what we're going to talk about in terms of defeat, like how do you dis define the long defeat? Some people call it like an apparently impossible but noble value. Isn't that what we're all doing? We're like trying to fight an apparently impossible but noble battle. That's the way some people look at it. I think this one's more of what I think, hope without any guarantees. You know, maybe, maybe we'll be able to do this. Lastly, it's Maybe the more optimistic people say it's an invitation to full, unapologetic engagement. You know, this long defeat. I want to be on it. I want to be where Jesus is. I want to go. I want to be successful on, on this long defeat. I live in the community that I work in. I just look around at my neighbors and I just feel like, you know, there's a lot about their lives that is a long defeat. They, ha they have many challenges and health care is very hard to obtain. But you see a lot of people saying, I'm not going to give up on my, my family member. I'm going to do everything it takes, and I'm going to walk that long defeat. And, and it might be a defeat. I might fail in the midst of that. But while they're on that journey, uh, we're also walking alongside them in that journey. And there's just a lot of things about taking care of our communities that make us liable to have a defeat. We are wondering. Uh, does it have to, does our work, that what we're all doing here, I mean, we have to admit it's not easy, right? I want us all engaging a little bit, like, right? It's, it's, it's hard. And I, I noticed that a lot of the breakout sessions are about how hard it is. So is our work always a defeat or never a defeat? I don't think we'd say that. Well, here's one of my non-defeat days. <laughs> this is the day that Esperanza Health Center opened in Kensington in our bank building. It's just a, a day of joy, a day where uh, that's a four-story bank building right on the corner of Kensington and Allegheny in the opio opioid community um, in North Philly. And um, you know, it's the days like that, you're like, we're gonna conquer the world. That was one day. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and it was a good day. But um, there's a do lot of days of broken hearts. There's, I'm sure if you guys are clinicians, there's a lot of days of broken hearts with your, the hopes you have for patients. And then for us that are in leading in ministry, there can also be broken hearts and failures. And so we want to talk about some of them today and maybe how do they happen? Why do they happen? What can we expect about our ministry? And maybe what are some helps, which there aren't really a, full answers to those questions, but we want to just uh, kind of talk about them together. So I just wanted to tell you one of mine. I have probably a handful of them that I could come up with at any given day. Uh, Esperanza, I've, I've been there 19 years, and um, when I first came, uh, it was pretty rough to be there in a certain sense because it was all new to me. I didn't know anything. I don't know if there's any new CEOs around here, but it's like at first all the words are different, and you don't know what you're doing, and we also, I think my very first payroll, we didn't have enough money, so we're starting off really backed against the wall, it felt like, but you know, as time went by, we, you know, we were kind of doing better, and things were going well, and we were growing. We grew really fast uh, to where we, I think we had three sites within those ten, first 10 years. And we were in Kensington at a different building than that, that I showed you. And I remember, you know, but I don't know if anybody's been part of a building project, really rough, right? You have to do twice as much work because you still have to do your normal, normal stuff. So we were building this building and I was feeling tired, but you know, just keep, just keep pressing it out. Keep going forward. Just keep going forward. And, um, so I was doing that, but at the same time, we were getting a lot of new people, and I wasn't really maybe tending to them or tending to at all as I, as I should have. Kensington was starting to get a little, it was always an underserved and under-resourced community, but, and it always had drugs, and it always was kind of violent, but it was getting um, a, a, like a step up, and the opioids were starting to get, kind of take over. And I, uh, we had a, um, we were renting a space, and three blocks away is where we had to park in a city lot. You know, those three blocks of walking from the parking lot to uh, the health center were getting, you know, really dangerous. And, you know, and we're getting lots of new patients, not used to being in Kensington, and uh, new um, employees and not used to being in Kensington. So like a little bit of grumbling started, you know, like, you know, why you want us to walk three blocks to work every day, you know, to get here. And, you know, I think we tried to, you know, take care of it as well as we could, but there really wasn't a solution. So we, we got a van and we, you know, we did things, we did a lot of things, but we did things, but it wasn't a safer place. And so then the grumbling started becoming a little bit more like complaints. And we also weren't moving into our new building yet because I think it was taking longer than we expected. And so people started complaining. And yeah, I remember we started, people go to their parking, to their car, and there'd be a person in their car. Uh, you know, that's pretty scary. You go to your car and there's somebody in it. Catalytic converters, we would, you know, people would, maybe two catalytic converters would be stolen a week. And you know, that's a lot, $1,500, at least when back then, it, was, it cost $1,500 for a catalytic converter. So our employees were like, you're not making it safe for me here. Now, that's what they were saying. I was hearing <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying the best I can. It's like Moses, you know, like we have so many people here. I don't know what to do next. Tell me something and I'll do it because we're trying to do everything we can. And I, I guess someone saying that you don't care uh, was the first time I felt like I'd heard that at Esperanza to me or to anybody really. Esperanza is very gracious. But it was this idea of somebody saying I didn't care. I, it just hurt me a lot. And so I, I became defensive. <laughs> which is the worst thing that a leader can do is be defensive with the complaints of the staff. But I was trying the hardest I can and I couldn't figure out anything new to do. And so I guess if I were to sum up how I was feeling in those moments, I, I felt alone, I felt inadequate because uh, I couldn't resolve anything. I felt like, I felt ashamed I felt ashamed that I couldn't make this work. Um, and I felt misunderstood. So I had um, I have really good friends that live right next door to me that both work at Esperanza. 
and I have dinner with them on Friday nights. And we don't really talk about Esperanza. We try to do other things, have fun, be friends. Um, but they kind of were noticing, or maybe they wanted to help me, um, <laughs> that, that I was a little bit more stressed out than they'd seen me at Esperanza. And so uh, Dan, he's a psychologist, and he's, he recommended I might want to see somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, if Dan, who loves me, thinks I should see somebody, I think I should uh, think about it. So he uh, hooked me up with a um, psychologist who doesn't work at Esperanza, knows, doesn't know me, and I went to see her. And it didn't take too many um, trips to see her before. Uh, in describing how I was feeling, I just blurted out, Esperanza is crushing me. And that's the way I felt, and there wasn't an answer in sight. And so I went for a few more times. Well, I went for a good number more times, but a couple more uh, weeks into it, I was, I was thinking, Esperanza is crushing me. And then I thought, there's another therapy office in North Philly right now where there's an Esperanza employee saying, Susan Post is crushing me. She doesn't care, and I don't have a catalytic converter. <laughs> she doesn't care about me. And, you know, it's just like a, um, to me, that was a moment of, of failure. I'm just going to tell you that much. It caused me to wonder, how did I get here? How did this happen? What has happened, and how, where are we going to go from here? And that's why we're having this talk today. And I want to invite Rick up. I'm just going to list some facts for you that are true. Uh, there's enough people who know me well in the audience that can contradict them if they think they're not true. But on my 50th birthday, I got called by two board members of Christ Community Health Services, the, the organization that I had been CEO of for only about nine months. I'd been, been at the organization since its founding for 19 and a half years, but without any warning, I was fired. I was removed from my role. Um, the board put in place someone who was very closely connected to one of the local hospital systems who had not been in healthcare before, and I had to stay and train that person who um, didn't know anything about healthcare. And I, I was expected to remain and still recruit and sort of vision cast, but. The conviction of the board was that the organization should be run by a business person, not a physician, especially not a physician that sometimes needed a muzzle and a leash. So, uh, why are you laughing about that? Yeah, I, I could only bear that, honestly, for a few months. I stayed for a few months, but I finally felt like I had to leave. And um, the organization sort of fumbled on getting a replacement CEO and um, the the board thought that I fomented a revolt, but I didn't. The providers left in mass, and so I saw the opportunity to spring into action, and so we had only a few months. We had contracts that required us to give six months notice, but as this was happening, I prayed hard, and I worked hard with others, and created a second organization to receive in just a few months those physicians, and we worked very hard to move the residency training program that we loved and was fruitful away from Christ's community. They didn't want it in the site anymore. And we had three years of the best three years of my life. We kind of had a second go at it. I had an amazing group of leaders around me. We had super engaged residents. It was super fruitful. We had 16 house churches. We were sending missionaries overseas. Every year we got to bring in six new residents, send out six residents. It was beautiful. Beautiful. And then, I mentioned briefly in the session earlier, there was a budget crisis, and the funding that we were dependent on and the partners that we had failed us, and I had to watch um, this dream die. Not only that, I had to see residents that I'd recruited to, been part of recruiting to Memphis, including interns who'd only been in Memphis for six months with a promise of training, like, it looked for a time that they were going to have to lose a year. People had bought houses. People had moved family members. I had risked my own finances to, because we didn't have any startup money to secure leases for clinics, and I was worried that I might lose my home. I had to go on medication, which is not an ignoble thing to do, but it died. The most beautiful thing I'd ever been a part of died. And then I 
had to come to this meeting and be, I, I, when I would write my application about why I was coming, they would say, what organization are you with and what, what's your role? And all I could come up with is, I'm a blue belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> that was the top of my license at that time. I went to being a ER doctor to feed my family. I couldn't get a job in Memphis at the two major hospital systems. Another hospital system did, did hire me. I got to be part of starting a health center in North Carolina. That was a beautiful life-giving piece of it. But about a year into that, I was working one Sunday morning, and I suddenly couldn't see very clearly. And I went to the bathroom and washed some water on your face, because I think that's what you're supposed to do, right? And when I came out, I had right hemiplegia. I couldn't walk. Fell into a wall. Fell onto the floor. Got taken to a CT scanner got helicoptered to another hospital where some guy put a catheter in my brain and pulled a blood clot out. I was not having a good three years. And I, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, but like, I, I didn't think that was very fair. So, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, why, th thank you, thank you. Why is it so hard? May God never give you the trials and temptations that I've had, or Lisa's had, but Lisa, I'm looking at Lisa, Susan's had. Lisa's had hers too, Lisa Werner. Why, why is it so hard? Why, why is it that if you stay in this game, it's, you're gonna suffer in some ways, probably in many ways? And so we have to have a biblical theological answer, and we do, right? Like, go all the way back to the foundation of the Bible, the book of Genesis, a pre-fall humanity was supposed to co-reign with God. We were called to multiply and rule over creation, to be co-regents, as the Reformed people like to say, rulers of the universe. And when we rebelled and broke faith with God, we really truly began to die, and we began to decay, and the earth and the entire cosmos began to decay, and work became hard. And this is a familiar passage, but it's the truth. The ground is cursed because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from what you were taken, for dust you are, some of you heard this a few weeks ago, and to dust you will return. The world's broken. Can I get a witness? <laughs> All right, and there's so few of us who are out to take care of so many people who need help, right? Like, it's bad enough, but there's not enough of us to do the work. Everybody else is doing other work. So a slide I show almost every time I speak of the city of Memphis, dots are 25 people, 25 uh, blue dots, 25 black people, red dots, 25 white people, Yellow dots are Latino folks. There's only like 40 Asians in Memphis, so there's no dots for them. I've made that joke a thousand times. It never gets a laugh. <laughs> there are enough doctors, dentists, healthcare workers in the city of Memphis for everybody. Where are they all? Almost all. They're in the places where they can get patients with insurance and good payment and safety. And so we say it pithily, where you see red doctors are competing with doctors to get patients, and where you see blue patients compete with patients to get doctors. And that's the way it is in Philadelphia, in New York, in LA, in rural America. It's overwhelming amount of work and a relatively small number of people who can do the fighting. So it, we're set up to have disappointments. All right, back to my co-presenter. So, besides the things he said, <laughs> um, the other thing is that there's um, just there's just a volume of things that are out to get us, um, and we're standing really against lots of challenges that are in front of us, and we can feel alone, uh, obviously. And our world is broken, and though it's redeemed, um, it remains broken and fallible. When I was in seminary, they had a kind of a theological way of describing that, the already, not yet, which is, you know, God's, Christ has already won the victory. We know it's going to be okay. We know that 
it isn't a, an ultimate defeat. It is an ultimate victory. And yet, we're not yet there. And um, we're living in a time when uh, the world is still uh, broken and fallible. It's not restored completely yet. And I remember walking recently through the park with my friend uh, from my neighborhood, and <clears throat> we were talking about the challenges with racial reconciliation. And, and we were talking about the victories that we can have hope for because Christ has come. But then there's the not yet, and we're living in this not yet that is so messy and still so broken. And my friend Janaira lamented, there's just so much not yetness in front of us. The journey for, of not yetness is still so long, but it's a spiritual battle. It's not just a physical battle. Um, her struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's why we're on a long defeat. That's why the, the, the way is hard. Um, yes, sometimes we're not really fully prepared. Um, I'd actually have to say after 19 years, I'm not professionally still fully prepared. Um, restaurants. It's just like hard every day. Um, there's just a, always new rules. There's always new hard things to do, but um, it's important, but we're not prepared, and we think we are. And I also feel like that was spir uh, that spiritually. You know, we go into this work um, thinking often, I'm going to do something great for God. I'm going to, you know, help people, which is true, but the, there's so much more to that story. There's so much more to us walking with the Lord that isn't about us being heroes, it's not about, um, it's not even really about what we're doing. It's about what, what's happening spiritually with the principalities and the powers, and where's our heart, and what, what, what are we doing with the Lord, and how is it all going? But it's hard. And I'm back to my partner. Just to be clear, we really believe there are dark spiritual forces of evil that are aligned against us. We're not conceptually, not corporations, like. Corporations are evil too, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> except, except yours. Um, an enemy who knows, knows us deeply, who has got thousands of years of experience, before whom we have, we are certainly defeated if we are fighting in our own strength and our own being. So I, I mentioned this a second ago. Like, I can look down my nose at what people call the prosperity gospel, the idea that right now God wants you to be completely healthy and completely blessed and completely welcome all, or I'm sorry, wealthy. I still had, I had this Christian version, even, I don't know, even whatever I am now, this idea that like if I make sacrifices and I move my family into the inner city and I work hard and I forego income and I try to be a blessing to my city and to, to everybody else, like pretty much it's gonna go well for me. Like I'm gonna have an unending series of victories from victory to victory. And that's bad theology. That's, that's not the truth. I think I even openly said it wasn't true. I used to give a lecture to our residents called There Will Be Blood to try to <laughs> explain to them like the sufferings and difficulties, but I still sort of believed that I would always be blessed externally in the work that I was doing. I think that's a mistake. If you have that notion even in the back of your head, I want to disabuse you of that. I also think in watching my own life and the life of many people, especially medical students over the last 30 years, is that we have an unexamined individualistic approach to life. What I mean by that is we make decisions about what I think is best for me and my skills and gifts, what's best for my family, and that we make those decisions unknowingly outside of the communion in the body of Christ and therefore outside of the protection that comes with being part of the body of Christ. Like By design, the Holy Spirit has given different gifts to different people and no one has all the gifts. And at some time or another, you're going to need, really need the help of others to keep you safe and to keep you accountable. And it does get tougher at the top. There's fewer and fewer people that you can go to. There's fewer and fewer people who understand you and what you're doing. We've got to have each other. And so I make these ridiculous proposals in the Bible, medical student Bible study. 
Kobe's in the back. Kobe spent a couple years in my living room when he was a student. I, used to, I usually try to talk the students into couples matching together, even though they're single men. Like, why don't three or four of you guys like pick a place and go together there as a team and, and change the culture of that place? That one hasn't been taken up yet, but I, I have only, I really believe this, been able to get to where I have been in stuttering obedience because I had three people I made a blood pack with, three medical students who were like me, 23 years old, and we agreed to do it together. And the blood part of it, I've told this joke a million times, but it's kind of true. Like if the blood part is if anybody backed out of those three, the, of those four, the other three would kill that person, right? <laughs> And that's an exaggeration, but there were times where I was dating girls that I shouldn't have been, and my friends rescued me from that. I was once working at a pediatric ICU in Memphis, and the fellow there asked me if I wanted to get on a helicopter and go pick up a sick kid in Arkansas. I said, yeah, I want to do that. He said, all right, we'll let you do that. All you got to do is commit to the fellowship, doing the fellowship of pediatric ICU. And I think if I hadn't had my friends around me, I would have made that move because it was just attractive. Like Christian people, we're not supposed to be alone. We're supposed to force the fellowship. It's like the dang Lord of the Rings thing. Like, dwarves and elves don't like each other. Get over it, right? <laughs> we need each other. We need this. We need to have a group of people who love us enough to tell us the hard truths and stick with us over years. Ask God to show you if you have unexamined individualistic thoughts and behaviors. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through this, but I want you to know, I'm gonna show you and you already know, that in the Bible, depression and despair are valid and normal. Okay, here's a quick run. This is this guy, Moses. Remember him? Arguably the most important figure in Judaism in the Old Testament. This is what Moses said to God in Numbers 11. Moses asked the Lord, why have you brought me this trouble on your, brought this trouble on your servant? Esperanza is crushing me. <laughs> what have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're gonna treat me, please go ahead and kill me. Did you get that? If I found favor in your eyes, if you like me, kill me. Do not let me face my own ruin. This is not a person in a good place, right? It's going to need a few sessions with Susan's friend. <laughs> King David, multiple laments in the Psalms, poems. This is Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord, oh my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Greatest action scene in the prophets in the Old Testament is Elijah taking on the 400 prophets of Baal and they build altars and whoever answers with fire, that's the Lord. Choose you today, Israel. Are you gonna follow Baal or the Lord? Elijah against 400 and God shows up. It's amazing victory. And then he gets word that Jezebel, the keeper of the 400 dead prophets is gonna take his life. She makes an oath that she's going to. And so here's Elijah, the, vic the victor of the mountain showdown. He's afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Does it happen in the New Testament? Yeah. You're familiar with this guy, wrote a couple of books. Second Corinthians wants you to be, don't want you to be uninformed. Brothers and sisters about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. 
Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. And then our religion's founder said it more succinctly, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. God's greatest servants, the most the luminaries of the Bible, experience profound depression to the point of wanting to die, to the point of despair, right? Like depression, despair is when you give up hope. This is our, these are our forebearers, not just the Old Testament, the New Testament. So are there helps for the long defeat? Oh, certainly there are, right? So I want to tell you what I just did. I want to validate whatever suffering you've already suffered or are suffering now, meaning I want you to know that it's really bad. We want you to know that it's, we know that it's bad. Some of you signed on for something that seemed wonderful and dreamlike because you came to a conference, you let some inspirational speaker convince you to give your life to Jesus in the health center and the work's harder than you thought and the patients are meaner than you expected and the leader who, who recruited you left for a better job somewhere. <laughs> when you step into this space, just like you do in any obedient Christian behavior, like you're opening yourself up to suffer. If you're going to love people who need to be loved, it's going to be hard sometimes. And everybody, sooner or later, is going to get down. I used to joke that my wife and I were on different curves. Like, when she was up, I was down. And when she was down, I was up. And that was a blessing that if it ever happened like this, there's going to be a murder-suicide. <laughs> Whatever you feel, it's legit. It's real. All right? And the normalizing means you're not alone. And it's not wrong what you're feeling. And you shouldn't blame yourself and have more shame because of the way you're feeling, because that's not what good Christian people do. The suffering's real, and your experience of it is real and legitimate, and you're not a weirdo. You're not alone. These, these biblical characters are attestation to that. So... <clears throat> I feel what we need is a better theology of suffering, um, better than the theology that um, Rick was thinking about um, earlier in his life. And um, I went to a I had it took a class on the theology of suffering once, and um, it's very disappointing. Um, the whole question was why, why do we suffer, and um, or why doesn't God do something? Like there were all these like whatever reason you're going to give, that class would say that's not the right reason or find a reason why that's not the right reason. But I think, what I think of theology of suffering, I think we need to be thinking, what do I know? What do I, there's a lot I don't know, but what do I know um, about what God's doing or what's happening when I'm suffering? And so I, I wrote out a little bullet point theology of suffering a few years ago of my suffering, Susan Post, in my neighborhood. And I, I, my, my theology of suffering kind of came out of um, experiencing violence in the community and you know, trying to move past that and doing that with my neighbors. And so um, I just want to encourage us to, uh, you to consider this. Think, c c what do you think about suffering? What do you know about suffering? What can you cling to on the day when you're not sure what's happening, you don't even know who you are anymore, and you need to know the truth? So, I encourage you to just write some truths down that you know about the Lord. Um, I think you should look in the Bible to find your, uh, your bullet points. And I want to share just a few of them um, that I've had throughout these years with you. But write your own. Figure out. Um, and when you make a discovery about God and where is he in the time of suffering and a particular thing, take a moment and write that down because you're not going to remember it on the day that you might need it. And so... Yeah, think about what is your theology of suffering? I'm just sharing a little bit of mine. So I start off with what we've been saying. The brokenness of our world is pervasive. We don't just wait till we get to another day where it's not going to be broken. Um, it's going to be broken every day in a multitude of different ways. So maybe don't get hyped up that it's the world's falling apart, though it is. Um, but uh, just don't be surprised, as uh, I think it says in James, when you meet trials of various kinds. The world is full of 
um, suffering. Uh, so um, again, I'm trying to find, we're trying to use uh, scripture for these things. Uh, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Our world is groaning um, because of its brokenness. So the world is broken, but the Lord is not overwhelmed. He is not broken. Those two things, pretty important. Don't get too, don't fret too much, but God, because the Lord is not broken. He's not overwhelmed. He is present. And my third bullet point, we are invited to bring our brokenness to him. So again, brokenness makes us feel alone very often, but he beckons us to come to him and to offer him how we're feeling, how we're doing. He's inviting us to bring our brokenness to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Fourth bullet point that I had to learn uh, through experience, I really, I think when I first started as Esperanza, trauma wasn't really talked about so much. And it really was a, a, a hard thing for me to really even grasp or understand that there is, uh, things happen to us. We're not meant to be traumatized. Um, and so sometimes I would be in situations of trauma and I would just get back up and go into work or, you know, I would just move on. and. And I, I think for me, when it comes to my suffering, which has to do with um, often with violence in our community, I just have to remember that that breaks the shalom that God created us for. It's not meant to be, and that time is needed for that restoration. Again, this is my bullet point for um, a theology of suffering. I have to remember that. This one's beautiful. God uses the body of Christ to restore. And as Rick was saying earlier, <clears throat> we need each other. You know, the hand can't say to the this isn't, those aren't the right body parts necessarily. The hand can't see to the head, I have no need of you. We need each other, and I, that's the beauty. That is the beauty of this group. That's the beauty of Esperanza for me, <clears throat> that God has given us helps. So we're not all our, on our own. We have him who's inviting us, but we also have people. And I can't tell you how many times people at Esperanza have, maybe in a foursome, had to walk me, put me in front of the Lord. Another bullet point for me is not only does Jesus invite us, God invite us to, um, uh, to tell him our burdens, but that Jesus is actually praying for us. Uh, Jesus Christ, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. I mean, just the idea that, like, you know, sometimes you wonder, is my prayer going anywhere? But just thinking Jesus is praying for me in the midst of this. When I don't know what I need or what I need to be praying for, Jesus is there praying. And this is just a culmination of maybe those other, um, the, the points I have so far, but sifting will happen <laughs> in our lives. Um, and and uh, we hope we get over something and it won't happen again, but there will be another sifting that will happen, especially in the ministries that we're in. And I'm most, um, I think, encouraged these days by this encounter that, um, you know, Jesus had with Simon when he was telling him that you're going to uh, betray me three times. And Simon's like, no way, I'm not going to do that. You're my man, I'm, you're my God, whatever. <clears throat> but Jesus is so kind. Um, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to shift you as all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brother. I just love all the sections of that, that Jesus would tell him in advance, you're going to be sifted, but I've prayed for you, and that your faith won't fail. Like, my faith on its own will fail, but Jesus is praying that my faith will not fail. And then he also says to Simon, and when you turn back, there's an encouragement there. When we fail, he's prayed for us, we will turn back, and when we turn back, strengthen your brother. And when I think of my shame at times when I failed at Esperanza, you think of Peter, you know, he looked into the eyes of Jesus after he had betrayed him. And he, scripture says he went out and wept bitterly. And um, I almost can't imagine, it makes, it nerves me to think of uh, 
that sort of shame and failure, and yet um, Jesus is so loving to him, and Jesus is carrying him in the midst of what's about to be his, um, Peter's biggest failure. And as we know the story later, he, he calls him back and restores him 100%. Another bullet point is the Bible tells us that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those that are crushed in spirit. At times when we're in these moments, we might feel like God is far away, but he is close um, and particularly looking at you in your moment um, of despair. Sometimes we're just off doing all the things that um, we think God's called us to. And I really feel like we can forget that the cross is for us as well as for our patients. And it shows us the great extent of his love and restoration. Cling to the cross. And really, he went to the cross so that the things that are around us, will, he will restore fully. I have to talk about repentance in the midst of this because there's things that do happen outside of us, um, maybe that we don't have a lot of um, responsibility for. But I think a lot of our failures are because of um, some way that we have gone away from what God's called us to do and to be. Uh, certainly that's true for me. Um, and I just love this verse, you know, it's God's kindness. God's kindness is intended um, to lead us to repentance. Repentance is a life bringing thing. And I think sometimes even in that time of failure at Esperanza, I was afraid of facing my own um, sin. And so I didn't go running to the Lord uh, for his uh, joyful, um, forgiveness of me um, to lead me toward repentance. Um, again, it, I have to have this on my list because it's not always the first thing I'm thinking about. But, you know, just pausing to ask God, will you, will you examine me right now? And will you help me to know um, how to come to you, how to follow you, where I've said something or done something that, um, that you don't want, that isn't life bringing? And Will you um, bring me um, the grace um, that, to come to you in repentance? I think the more we, we get into that rhythm of repenting, um, the more we find a lot of joy in our life because he covers it 100% so much. And then lastly, this is my last uh, bullet point. The Lord hears, he sees, he restores, and he loves. And this is uh, Hagar with uh, Ishmael. And remember, uh, you know, she got thrown out um, by Sarah, and she's wandering around in the wilderness, and she's not the chosen people, and yet God doesn't um, let her sit in the wilderness without taking care of her and her son, and she actually names God, you are the God that sees me. And um, again, when we're in those desperate times, um, there's a God who's hearing, seeing, restoring, and loving. I think those are all my points, but write your own, the ones that you like. Just wanted to end it with a little bit of um, <clears throat> encouragement that I've received throughout my time in ministry. This is my pastor, uh, Manny Ortiz. He passed away um, a couple, oh, about five years ago, actually. And Manny was a, um, a person who, he was very, he wrote a book, books on urban ministry. He taught about it. He was my um, seminary professor. But he, he led a church of people that were all out in ministries. He just launched people here. I mean, you had an idea. He had you serving the Lord with it. Um, but because we were a church that had so much serving, um, and he was our pastor, as a pastor, he tried to help us to keep on target at the times where you feel like I'm overwhelmed with ministry. And he led us to always coming back to Jesus. It's just Jesus. And you have to find Jesus before you can share Jesus with others. So his calling to us always was just come back, face the Lord, meet the Lord, be with the Lord, because you can't serve others until you grab that and you found it yourself. So I found a sermon recently that he had um, <clears throat> said, and these were, you know, this was part of what he said. He said, you know, seek the peace of the city. That's what we're, many of us are trying to do, right? That's our, that's our calling, seek the peace of the city. And he says, you can't seek the peace of the city in Jeremiah 29, 7 without also considering Jeremiah 29, 13. Seek me and find me. We often lose track of the whole picture. We need two hands on the cross. This is my D-min class. This was 15 years ago. I look a lot different back there. He says, if we're going to bring people near to God, we have to come near to God. 
And I guess for us, I would say, if we want to bring the healing power of Christ to our patients in our community, we need to receive the healing power of Christ. And in this sermon, he says, Father, give us that spirit of joy and repentance. And I don't know if you, any of you guys can name these three people, but that's Manny Ortiz. These were um, my three heroes that were at the beginning of Esperanza's um, hunting park site. Uh, Ron Sider, he's also passed away recently. He wrote Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, it was very much about justice. And then there's uh, Dr. John Perkins, um, who's kind of the founder of um, Christian Community Health Fellowship. And I look at those men and I think <clears throat> of the words long defeat. They live, Dr. Perkins still alive, but they lived lives that were just totally sold out for ministry. And they had many failures. And yet, knowing all three of them, their hearts were so tender. And their hearts were tender because they stuck with Jesus. They went to Jesus. They found life in Jesus. They didn't get confused like I do about what is it all about. It's not about the ministry. It's not about Esperanza. It's about um, Jesus. And I, I think about um, <clears throat> Manny. I, I, I spoke at Lawndale the week before he passed away. He was very sick. I spoke at a retreat for the, um, the providers. And he said, sometimes I could run my, t you know, things I wanted to say by him. And he, you know, he's like, so send it to me. Yeah, I'll talk to you about it. Uh, and he was, again, very, very sick at the time, and he missed our time because he was sleeping. But I'm like, okay, we're ready. We're on the phone. And he goes, okay, encourage them with Jesus. Whatever you do, whatever you say, encourage them with Jesus. I'm like, oh, we're not going to talk about what I wrote? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no. The whole thing is encourage them with Jesus. Uh, j just a couple other things that came to my mind and then we, we have a few minutes that we'd like to engage this is a very a large group maybe difficult to do that suffering is redemptive it it causes good things to happen it seasons us it makes us more patient it gives us more capacity to love it teaches us humility it was important enough that even God required it of Jesus it was you learned obedience through suffering, according to the New Testament. So the truth of Christology is that he redeemed the world through his suffering and that we are, in, in a small way, when we suffer in the work that he's called us to, we are participating in the very sufferings of Jesus with him. And that's no small thing. Lastly, it's a long defeat before an eternal victory, right? The same Paul who wanted to kill himself, who was flogged and beaten and shipwrecked and stoned, said that I consider our light and momentary str struggles are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Do you believe it? Our pain is real. Our pain is inevitable. Our pain is going to last to the end. But it's not a tear is going to have fallen in vain. We should steal each other put our hope in that firmly and soldier on, right? Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being patient. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Susan Post. Christian Community Health Fellowship exists to encourage, engage, and equip Christians to live out the gospel through health care among the poor and marginalized. If you enjoyed listening to CCHF Talk, make sure you follow, like, and share on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. To learn more about Christian Community Health Fellowship, visit cchf.org. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Join us next time for another episode of CCHF Talk.